Hello, welcome to Truth Not Tradition online Bible study for May 7th, 2017. I'm Tony Smario, coming to you as always from my father, brosal.org YouTube channel. And so let's first thank uh, the few of you that, that uh, wrote to me, and perhaps uh, at least one of you claimed to write to Richie from Boston that I'd asked you to in the last broadcast. And I appreciate that, um, you know, it's, and some of the comments from the people who listen all the time were really encouraging and enlightening. And I think, I, you know, I agree with you. There's, in fact, more than you know, I've been doing a little study the last few days to try and determine. For instance, Richie from Boston, I find out is when you look at his show notes and the links, because I went to try and look at some of the links to find out where is he going and these other places to get his information. And in the every one of his show notes is to please support his sponsor, getthetea.com. <laughs> and so you find out it's like a whole network of outlets sponsored by somebody making a tea. I mean, it all just, it makes me laugh because it absolutely, you know, it's oh, it's it's like in uh, Sherlock Holmes when he says it's so overt, it's covert. So, yeah, I see. So don't please don't waste your time uh, writing on my behalf to Richie from Boston. I get it now, uh, and I see the pattern. And in a next sort of trending, I want to talk about some of the different topics that I think are leading the truther. Uh, disinformation movement but for the most part I think it's you know we're far more fortunate to be a small group focused on what's really at hand and the fact that there is you know is such a uh, an outlet because I can't find you know I'd really I know someone sent me a link to a Alan Watt and I went and listened for a short time and I didn't find anything very enlightening about Alan, except the same old, you know, in you know, truth or insider understanding that the elections are all rigged and they're poisoning us and we can't trust them. And it's all this, what I called the uh, last week, externalization of the hierarchy, I believe, is what's happening in our world. And so the good and the evil are coming out next to each other and everything is being identified. But in the manner of chaos, because chaos is still what it's all being used to create, not clarity, uh, because the order doesn't come until after the chaos. And so in preparing for the Bible study, I've been led to a few places in my study of these other things, the end times things. And, and so I, I wound up basically today with two different I got two different Bible studies in mind. One's got to do with the end times that we're chasing, the identification of what's going on and why. And the other, with basic Christianity, what does it really mean and why? Because as I was saying this past week in a little fit of frustration, you know, getting 50, 60, 90 views, which is, again, I, I, I really do appreciate that there is a, a steady group, it would appear, that listen to this stuff, but um, it's, of course, of no impact except to keep uh, helping uh, this small group, of which I include myself, uh, expanding our own search. And I, I'm grateful that, you know, we're here for that. But I feel that there's some important things that need to be said to people, you know, that the trumpet needs to be at least uh, attempted to sound. So, the, so that uh, it, as many as might hear it can uh, make their own decision. And uh, one of them is the one I've been working on for some time that's got to do with the metaphysics of love and a real look at what, you know, an answer to John's concept that God is love. You know, how do you, how do you, re how do you reconcile that metaphysically? What would that look like? And I, and I, believe that I have uh, something at least worth looking at. And 
this big lie that's behind the great secret that all the secret societies and the occult is as above, so below lie. That's affecting a lot of people right now, a lot of young people that, you know, that might otherwise, I, I suppose, and I don't know how smart anyone is anymore. I don't know what, what's left. I don't have children and I'm, I'm not around enough young people to, to know whether they're smarter than us or, or really turned into half robots already, which is my unfortunate suspicion. Uh, we always thought we were smarter than our parents, but look what we did with the world. <laughs> so I don't have much hope for these poor kids. I feel like it's not really their fault. We, we didn't leave them much. We didn't do much with what we were left. The whole thing's been really heavily programmed and controlled in our part of the world. And, and we're the ones that got off lucky. You know, if you were in other parts of the world, you were getting controlled in far more harsh uh, ways by far more uh, cruel and violent means that you know made America look good all this time, and nobody wants to look at the quite e easy truth to see that the same people behind America, the same characters that we revere as being such great founders of our democracy our school systems, our business systems, all this, you know, are the same people that that were responsible for all the death and destruction. So the world is a very dark place. And, you know, here in the, like the Bible study part of it, at least most of you are aware of that, that that is the picture that's painted in Scripture and not this prosper. Everybody should be living happily ever after with big smiles and banks full of money and, you know, that sounds an awful lot like God's kingdom, not the one that, you know, the prince of darkness runs, that we're all supposed to be, you know, hanging on. And so I've decided that in the order that I started studying this stuff this week, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll tackle it, because some of the other stuff I really have to say to people has to do with the, in addition to this Christian message, I feel, is to the Laodiceans and all of us. And I say I... I don't think any of us fortunate enough to be from our culture, have a computer, live in comfort, closet full of clothes, car in the driveway, you know, kids in school, everybody, you know, like none of us practically know how to grow anything or have to do anything physical to survive. We just go to work and then spend that money on our survival. We're, we're such a weird race of people, such an unnatural race of people. I don't see how we could keep, if we're believers, could keep from being part of that Laodicean age or character of the church. If you're not, you know, really fighting, suffering somewhere, you know, if you're not someone who's just suffering the way he suffered, I mean, isn't that what it says? So anyway, that's that's to me the, the most important message is to somehow try and demonstrate that that's what it really says, as opposed to this prosperity message. That's what it really says, as opposed to this, you know, it doesn't matter once you, you know, you, you just keep praising Jesus. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And it doesn't matter what you do, you know, that um, that's the same comes from the same people that sold us the rapture. So I think that's a very important message to try and expose. And for the few people that listen to me, you keep listening to this Bible study because you you sort of know that message. You've heard it, and I'm I'm so happy. It's so it's uh, I think it's a demonstration of the power of the message because it's not an easy one to hear. So unless we're really suffering and giving it up somehow, turning our other cheek, you know. It, out there facing it, no purse, no staff, no nothing to lean on but that word. At, at any moment, ready to be beaten or locked in jail, uh, you know, ready to die for anything at any moment because we're not afraid. We're not martyrs out with a sad face. We're we're just not afraid because this life is not all there is. And in fact, if we believe what it said, we're. We're here to display something else to the world, that fearlessness that is faith. The Paul writes, perfect faith 
overcomes fear. So perfect faith equals fearlessness, according to Paul. So you can also equate the fact that Jesus said, O ye of little faith, which means we're full of fear. <laughs> These are the, it's pretty easy to see. And then the psychologists come along and take advantage of that to find out how to turn us into their little minions and dupes. And, and so being part of the Laodicean church doesn't mean anyone's going to hell. That's all a lie. And, and next week, I want to tackle some of that. But this week, uh, I, want to, I want to go to what I think is also very important that needs to be said right now in this world full of so-called Christian eschatologists, prophecy teachers, etc., who've never seemed to understand Scripture. Now that I finally am just getting a glimpse of what it might mean, this beast and the, the seven-headed beast, the seven-headed dragon, this this rebuilding of the temple and this coming of the false messiah and the 666, uh, all these things that we've been brought up in just to play on our fears, um, you know, has always been misunderstood. And, and the way I see it now is we're watching for what, you know, the most likely surface level evidence, in my view, event would have to be this covenant he makes with many for seven years. And then we'll find out who the he is. We'll find out what the covenant is. But the fact that this whole prophecy from Daniel, who seems to be either it's all a really big hoax, and Daniel was somehow pieced together so painstakingly as to mimic history, or Daniel really is the strongest piece of prophetic literature that we have. Daniel's the one that sees Nebuchadnezzar's image, sees the beasts separately, sees the goat and the, you know, the, with the big horn run into the, to the ram with the two horns, or vice versa. The, uh, yeah, the goat and the ram. Uh, you know, he he sees the seventy-week clock that ticks down to coincidentally right at the time when the Messiah is killed, but not for himself. I mean, darn it. Daniel's either the key, as my dad was saying, this is the key to the ministry my father started many years ago, is recognizing that, wow, look at Daniel. If that's true, then that holds the key to identifying the end time sort of um, framework or background or historical uh, historical narrative that this all is going to fall into. And so where everyone got thrown off as Daniel sees four beasts and the last one, that's it. That one tramples the whole earth. There is no other kingdom that takes over from that one. And so, of course, no other kingdom did. But on that land, it became something quite mixed. Iron and clay rather than just iron. So the iron's still there, but it's mixed with clay, something that seems incompatible. And so, of course, what you find takes over is Muhammad's kingdom of Islam. But now when you do your history, you find out Muhammad's kingdom of Islam was co-opted, just like the church was co-opted. And that's why I don't want to, you know, darn it, it's hard for me the more I have learned about, you know, the, the eschatological viewpoint of Sheikh Imran Hussein, even though we disagree about a, a lot of stuff, he's brought out what's written there in the Quran and how he sees it, this, this mountain of gold that's going to come out of the river Euphrates in the end days, and everybody's going to fight over it, and 99 out of the 100 that fight will be killed. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, that's yeah, pretty good, right? Predicting this return of the Son of Mary is one of the central plots of the story that these barefoot shepherds will be building buildings high up into the sky, racing each other to see who can build the highest building. Look at Dubai today. <laughs> and these uh, United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Kuwait and all these people that used to be barefooted shepherds now trying to build a taller and taller and taller building. And I don't know. Are those prophecies? I, one thing I want to say that struck me again and again is, you know, all this supposed tampering with this book that's so unreliable, but how do you tamper with prophecy that's talking about in that day, 
these people, I'll bring these people against these people. How do you know how to tamper with it, not to screw it up and and make it go the wrong? How do you know who you're going to be at war with 2,000 years from now, 3,000 years from now? So all you can really do in tampering with it is things like I suspect in Revelation, for instance, where at the very end of talking about who gets thrown in the lake of fire and then anyone's name not written in the book of life, that, that occurs at the beginning where you... And then right tacked on at the end. And then anyone whose names are written in the book of life, they're thrown in the lake of fire. Whoops. That sounds like it was tacked on to me simply because all the rest of the Bible refutes it. What about Jesus telling goats to the left and sheep to the right? What about Paul saying people that don't have the law but do what the law calls for are a law unto themselves? So it just uh, you know it doesn't make any sense that suddenly only these Christians... Only those who follow Jesus, everybody else going into the lake of the fire with the devil. Okay, I say, we, you know, the whole scripture refutes that. So if that's what you think it says, because that's what those words seem to say, well, then, you know, understand that those words have been in control of a lot of people for a long time, just like the Quran and the Muslim scriptures. But on prophecy, how do you know what to change? <laughs> so... I love the idea that God came along because they corrupted Christianity now by 600 AD. You can't trust anything that they're doing in the real church, so he gives Muhammad a vision. This poor Arab doesn't read or write, you know, and he has a vision. So what do you do as the Catholics who have the power? You go in there and take it over, just like you took over Christianity as soon as you could. So that makes sense to me in history. And that all fits with the same empire. They went and co-opted, and that does fit in with the Vatican. But remember, the Vatican is simply an outgrowth. It's the expression of this beast that goes all the way back to Babylon. The secrets, the mysteries don't come out of the Vatican. They're hidden in the Vatican. And they're not hidden in every Catholic who say, and Jesus is my Lord and Savior. See, that's the subtle deception. They've got everybody on the outside, even the white pope. Don't you get it? The black pope, the white pope. That's because the real mystery is hidden in the balance of the two. That's why everybody wants to talk about the pope as the antichrist. And the. And next week I want to talk about that antichrist in the framework that it's actually written in. In the framework of what Christianity actually is. But I see the Pope as simply the white expression. He's the, he's the one bringing people into the fold by saying what you're supposed to say as a Christian. We're all equal under God. Just because we got homosexuals, we've always had that. We can't kick them out of the church, guys. We can't hate everyone. We can't go along with the way the world's doing it right now. Don't you all see that? Don't we have to turn to the scripture? Don't we have to turn to love and the gospel message? I mean, come on, isn't, what else could you say? What else could a Christian say except let's follow Christ and be like Christ and approach everything the way he might approach it? He didn't condemn anybody. So all his friends were prostitutes and tax collectors and, you know, the people that were thought least of in society that were thought disposable or worse. And those were the people who loved Jesus and, and it would appear that he loved them too. And so, you know, Christianity is just so far off base that it's pathetic. But today, I want to go to Christians' favorite, one of their favorite end time prophecies that, you know, is misunderstood as everything else simply because it's on purpose. Let's talk about. Gog and Magog, because I was led to Ezekiel 38 and 39 this week. And in my Bible, just to show you how tampering gets done, in those that have been following know I use this uh, Holy Bible from the ancient East Eastern text, which is the George M. Lamza translation from the Aramaic of the Peshitta. <laughs> and I've checked it against my other scripture many times, and it seems to be practically the same with just a few little differences in words not not meanings 
and we'll maybe see one next week a little bit. But uh, I did notice in this whole big CERN, uh, you know, Mandela effect, fear mongering BS propaganda splurge about several months ago that the old King James Bibles or otherwise New Internet, I don't know, the ones that my parents uh, have for a long time that are still here in, in my place in Mexico, they both have bottles in place of wineskins in the, in the parable when Jesus says you don't put new wine into, uh, or old wine into new, or new wine into old wineskins because they'll burst. You need to put them in new wineskins so they stretch. Uh, the word's been changed to bottles. And I was one of the people screaming about that six months ago because I, that's the, I recall that that's the place I first was encountered the word wineskins was in that parable as a teenager reading the scripture. So I was someone that could confirm that, wait a minute, it didn't say bottles, it said wineskins, but now in those Bibles it says bottles, and I don't know why, but in my Bible from the Peshitta, it still says wineskins. So before anyone goes and writes off my Bible, <laughs> I say that we have to all understand that you know, where do, who, you know, who put these things together and for how long has this whole world been co-opted by that fourth beast? But what can they say about prophecy? So in this Bible, which seems to be accurate on the wineskins instead of bottles, the word for Gog and Magog has been changed to China and Mongolia. How's that for a swoop in and translate it the way you think it should be translated, which means perhaps it had already been translated into those areas, uh, into meaning those kingdoms in the Aramaic. And, and it was faithfully translated, but the translator was translating what had already been decided was China and Mongolia. It's not hard to see why, considering this Aramaic text was at one point controlled by the Ottoman Empire, who might have had a hand and not wanting Gog and Magog to clearly refer to what would have been what we call Turkey today. And so I've done a little study to try and prove that to myself, and you can do what you like about that and say what you want and follow all the Christian BS that says it's Russia. It's not possibly Russia, although Russia's part of it. Uh, if, I get, if I can get to this today, I'll show you. But it's quite clear that Gog, Meshach, Tubal, you can find maps in which these were the names given to areas of Turkey. And so what, the, what it looks like to me is that this is one of the earliest families to have settled that part of the land after the flood that had turned to their own way or whatever this evil way that we're going to say comes out of Nimrod and you know, that I'm going to say, if it's embodied in these secrets and the Tower of Babel, all these allegories, it's in the fact that man is his own God and that Lucifer set man free from the garden. He's not the bad guy. He's the good guy. That's the secret that they're all hanging on to because the church will kill him if, if you try and come out and say that in the open. So perhaps that was already, you know, what Nimrod's kingdom was dedicated to. And now here we are in this perhaps same part of history. This is over here where Turkey is. And the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel. And now remember, we're, we're down the road in Ezekiel's time, but he's referring to this land because this is who these people come out of. Is Gog, one of the brothers. If you look at it, it's the Gog, Meshach, and Tubal are brothers and Tom, uh, what's his name there? Uh, Tamagarth, or we'll get to it in a minute. He's a son or a father of one of them. So anyway, it all makes sense if you simply, you know, get off the the traditional brainwashing, like what Paul says is, you know, catching away before the man of sin can be revealed. 
what Paul says is forsake. That's the word that's used. Forsake. When you all forsake this, when this is all forsaken, then the man of sin can be revealed. That's what it really says. And the Christians were convinced that it says caught away. And so they're waiting to be caught away. You know? So same thing here. Son of man, set your face against Gog, land of Magog, which is the land ruled by Gog. That's what that means. Not to not Gog and Magog. Not to not set your face against Gog and Magog. No, set your face against not only the ruler Gog. This is the way you're going to see it play out, in my opinion, but against also the land that that ruler rules, the land of Magog. And that's where in our poetic license here uh, of, 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 of the ability of prophecy to reach out into time and into to be shadow and fulfillment, to be the substance that's forever casting the shadow into the future, you have to wonder if that Magog, land of Gog, does not extend then to all that Gog became, what shall say, you know, UN or whatever this spirit is. But anyway, for now, let just we can look at it quite simply as being this land of what we call Turkey today and Gog, whoever's ruling that land. And I'm not sure I'm willing to say we're talking about Edrawan Ed Ed here as far as the Turkish uh, leader. I'm not sure he's the one that we're talking about, but we're certainly talking about that land and those Muslims. Okay, so, and not as Muslims, so don't get me wrong. Come on, let's keep, you know, keep in the spirit of the poem here for a minute so we can try and grasp the prophecy. So the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and against the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, his brothers. So this is, and chief prince, I, the, the little research I did seems to indicate first prince, the foremost prince. He's the one that set it all up. This is like the Pharaoh that set up Egypt to be what it is. And now the Pharaohs that follow, they are Pharaoh, but they're Pharaoh in the line of the first Pharaoh. That's what it sounds like to me from what I learned. That's what God's saying. So try and keep your mind open to the poetic license of Scripture to be prophetic and, and, and eternal, as well as specific and local, is the way I see the way, I mean, you know, the way it would have to be dimensional, is what I'll go ahead and sum it up metaphysically. So, son of man, set your face against Gog and against the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will gather your people together and put a bridle in your jaws, and I'll bring you forth out of your country, both you and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in armor, a great host with spears and shields, all of them handling swords, Persians, Ethiopians, and Libyans with them, all of them with shields and helmets, Gomar and all her army. I think this is another one of his brothers. And in these old maps, Gomar is also in Turkey. So it's another area of that land ruled by, by Gog, the, the chief prince of these brothers, this family, this original family that ruled that land following the flood. If I'm on to the, the poem or the, or the encyclopedic idea of it uh, correctly. Gomar and all her army, the house of Togama, Togar, Togarma, and the uttermost parts of the north with all their hosts and many other people who were with you. Oh, wow. So now you got your, to just sum it up without spending a ton of time, we can all see what we're talking about here. If this is Turkey, and that's why I say I don't see this being Erdogan. I see this being the alliance, the other alliance meant to come against, the one that's being funded in the, the Pikean version of a third world war. This is that other alliance. So China is part of it is why I'm going to correct this whole thing here where, you know, this whoever interpreted this was had an idea of China, but 
it doesn't say against you China, but against you Gog. And Gog is this chief leader, this first leader of these people. But now through Gomer and the house of Togarma, which the little bit I've learned, Togarma, I can't even remember, was a father or a son. I think the father of these kids. And through this includes, it would seem, Togarma and all her army, the house, I mean, Gomar and all her army, the house of Togarma, and the uttermost parts of the north, with all their hosts, now the uttermost parts of the north, that would be Russia, you know, Mongolia, Siberia, and many other people who are with you. That sounds like China to me. That sounds like India, Afghanistan to me. So that's my guess, anyhow, if this is all relevant to what we're talking about. Prepare yourself and all the people that are assembled with you and be a protection to them. You have been commanded in former days and in the latter years you shall come against the mountains of Israel and against the land which is at peace and free from the sword, whose people were gathered from many nations, and now they all dwell safely in it. So, you know, I, f I forget to mention this when I'm talking about all these modern people spouting war, 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 now's the time, end of time. When Jesus said wars and rumors, wars, but don't be alarmed, the end's not yet. How come everybody in the scripture seems to see peace instead of war? So, yeah, Ezekiel, the land which is at peace and free from the sword, nobody's at war, right? Three and a half years, if we're right, if Daniel's correct, or if our interpretation of Daniel's correct. The land which is at peace and free from the sword, whose people were gathered from many nations, and now they all dwell safely in it. Oh, well, there you go. God's people, Israel, right? My people, my people, my people. That's the proof. Well, not so fast, I say. If you pay attention here for a few minutes, I think you'll see that there is quite a distinction, at least the way I'm uh, reading these couple of chapters. So no, not God's people, but many people <laughs> were gathered there. That's quite interesting, isn't it? The, the, the accuracy of that, you'll come against, you've been commanded in former days. Who's this you? This Gog. That's why it's not just Turkey. It's this alliance, right? You've been commanded in former days, and in the latter years you'll come against the mountains of Israel and against the land. When were they commanded in former years? You mean when the Ottoman Empire was created by the Catholics or the Jesuits or whoever was working through them to send Islam in those, you know, remember how long it been since Islam was anything like Muhammad's Islam. It's been taken over a long, long time. And off they go on the Crusades. And so, uh, I don't know, that's what makes sense to me. You, you, you've been commanded in former days, and in the latter years you'll come, against the mountains of Israel, because that's what they did in former days. They went and got Jerusalem. <laughs> and against the land which is at peace and free from the sword, whose people were gathered from many nations, and now they all dwell safely in it. Whose people were gathered? By the Rothschilds, right? By the banking system. And you shall come up like a storm and like a cloud which covers the land, you and all your army and many people who are with you. Thus says the Lord God, it shall come to pass that in that very day thought shall come into your mind and you shall think an evil thought and you shall say, I will go up against a prosperous land. I will go against those who dwell in tranquility without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take captives and to take a spoil, to turn your hand against the desolate places that are now inhabited and against the people who were gathered together out of the nations who have gotten cattle and goods who dwell in the beauty of the land. Again, the people who were gathered together out of the nations. Watch how that contrasts God claiming to do it. This just says the people that were gathered together by the Rothschilds, 
or, you know, I use that term loosely. The Rothschilds were obviously operating for some syndicate of which it was a plan to gather these people to the Holy Land that are now inhabiting against the people who were gathered together out of the nations who have gotten cattle and goods who dwell in the beauty of the land. Sheba and Duran and the merchants of Tarshish and all its villages shall say to you, Are you come to carry off captives and to take spoil? Have you mobilized your host to take silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods and to take a great spoil? Right? Because didn't we make peace? Aren't we in peace? And now you're going to come with your great hosts for a spoil? Right? You just... You didn't just come to overthrow these guys, right? You're taking over all the peaceful place now. You're going to take the gold and the silver into your own, right? Because the evil thought just comes on them in that day, right? First, they got a good thought, maybe. Hey, we got to stand against this. This is too much the way I see it. Because, of course, this Zionism and NATO that finally decides they're going to take all that land after this destruction They've been reeking on these people for, well, a hundred years in the Middle East. Finally comes too much, and the Persians and the and the 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 people of you know that land of Turkey, the Russians, all these people, the China, they finally get together and that's it. It's us or them. But in that moment when they realize their power, they get an evil thought and say, Hey, let's take some you know, spoils. Screw them. Let's take their stuff. Um and that's the way it sounds like to me. So in all of that, now Sheba and Duran has been demonstrated to me to be Saudi Arabia. So how's that? That fits this Daniel prophecy of going after the oiliest region. And the Ethiopians and Libyans, it said, would be in his submission. And we see here in Ezekiel that the Ethiopians and Libyans will side with these other guys. So that makes sense, right? They're in opposition. He has to subdue them when he goes to to war to take this stuff so he's taken he's got ethiopia and libya with him when he goes to take duran now and sheba which is saudi arabia and the merchants of tarshish and all its villages that sounds like western europe say to you are you come to carry off captives and take a spoil whoa you're you're coming to do something quite different than defend sounds like that to me therefore son of man prophesy and say to gog Thus says the Lord God on that day, when my people Israel shall dwell in tranquility, you shall know it. Okay, When my people Israel, you shall know it. So this is the one reference to these people being my people Israel dwelling in tranquility. So are these his people Israel? This is a tough one. I, I'm going to say that it, it's simply that his people Israel are, are, uh, are, they, are represented there as the ones that have always been waiting for their Messiah and are against Zionism. And now they're in peace as well. And he knows it, this Gog. My people, Israel, are there and you know it. He doesn't refer to them as these people that have been gathered. And you can make that connection, but let me finish before you do, before you jump to that conclusion. This is what I thought too, but just wait. I'm just setting it up that I think here he's talking about his people being the few that are waiting. And you know it this king of Gog, and you shall come against. Okay, thus said the Lord, on that day when my people Israel shall dwell in tranquility, you shall know it, and you shall come from your place out of the north parts, you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host and a mighty army, and you shall come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land, It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring you against my land, and the nations will know me when I shall be sanctified through your defeat. So he's going to bring them against his land, Israel. So it keeps sounding like, oh, Zionists are the good guys, right? My people, Israel. I'm going to say, no, this is just the few before the temples kicked over. This is when they get to have their way the ones that they're using, these patsies, these Zionists in, 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 in heart, the ones that really think they got to build the temple in the manner of Moses. They have to repent and 
slaughter the animals and God will bring them their Messiah, which of course is going to happen. I think that's, you know, you got to make this distinction here, and I believe you'll see it before we finish Ezekiel, if I can get it done today. So you'll come against my people Israel, but the nations will know me when I shall be sanctified through your defeat. Thus says the Lord God, you are he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days and in those years that I would bring you against them. So now we know this isn't, the, this isn't just some prophecy standing alone. This is the prophecy of the same, see, same Gog and Magog. This is the same train from Nimrod kind of thing. It would be you that will come against them. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my anger shall be consumed in my fury and zeal. So it's going to be at this time that all this, that his anger will be consumed. It will be finished at the time that God comes against Israel. So that makes it pretty clear till you see those hordes from Turkey and all their minions with them coming. That's the end. That Jesus said, don't be alarmed. The end's not all these. That's why these, these wars and rumors of wars aren't going to lead to that. Not if Ezekiel's relevant. For in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there should be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that even the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the towers shall fall, and every wall shall crumble to the ground. I mean, that sounds like this whole sixth seal, doesn't it? Men hiding in the rocks, saying, oh my God, hide me from him who sits on the throne. I've always said, how do you know it's him who sits on the throne you're hiding from, and not just an earthquake? Well, Ezekiel says it too. All the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. You can call that allegory. I'm happy to say it's, it is just an earthquake and people are, oh God, oh God. It sounds like there's people of the earth are making a connection, that it isn't just a natural occurrence, but a supernatural one. But I'll leave that open to your own imagination. But anyway, I'm just coordinating it with the scripture I know as a Bible study here to say it. it it seems like we've got to refer to this sixth seal of revelation time, this end time, this shaking that convinces everybody, that shows everybody who God really is. That's why all this stupid modern stuff with these, these channels like Richie from Boston, yeah, they're going to open the veil and let the demons out. That's what we should all be afraid of. It doesn't seem to be what it says. It seems like everybody's going to be afraid of God in the end when he shakes it all up. Until then, it's wars and rumors of wars, and it's war that finally kills everyone. And I want you to listen further because we're going to come to something here. It doesn't sound like nuclear war to me, but let's let's keep going. Everybody connects Ezekiel with nuclear war, and I don't I don't see how that's true either. So after um, he says everybody's going to shake his presence, and I'll call for a sword against him. Throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. Now, this is, again, one of the misused terms Christian use that you know, everybody, you're going to be killing your brother at home in America. And you might be that too, but that's not the context of this. The context of this is still back where he says, you're the one I've spoken of in former days. You're the one all the prophets have prophesied about. I'm gonna, that I'm, it's you I'm going to bring against Israel. And in that days when everything's going to come crashing down, right? And I'll call for a sword against him, him, this guy, the one that's coming, this Gog with all his horsemen. I'll call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, all my mountains. That's all through there. Syria, Damascus, Israel, all the way down the coast there, all, all through the, this Middle East area. That's all God's mountains that we're talking about. So it's over there every man's sword should be against his brother. That's, I mean, that's the context. And I'll judge him with pestilence and with blood, and I'll reign upon him and upon his princes and upon the many people that are with him, 
and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Okay, you going to call fire and brimstone nuclear weapon? I don't think so. I'm not. I'm going to say volcanic activity along with natural disasters that just pellet, pelt everyone so that you know it's not somebody else's missile, not somebody's fake nuclear weapon that who knows how many they really have and what they plan to do with them. It's all just show. But God raining down fire, you know, fire falling out of the sky, shot from wherever he's shooting it, uh, and brimstone and rain and hailstones. That's what seems to take everybody out. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Thus, he says, right? And I will judge him. Who's the him? Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, that's brought all these nations now on Israel and taken the evil thought to take a spoil and take the gold and silver and steal all the cattle and the, right? Take the, the world over for himself rather than just set a right straight. Because if you're going to say this is the, the Shia Islam that's going to claim we're the righteous ones, right? Well, that doesn't sound very righteous to find, to have this evil thought and decide to take it all for yourself. Uh, but I'll judge him with pestilence and with blood. Pestilence, remember, see, not nuclear weapons, pestilence and with blood. I'll rain upon him and upon his princes and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself in the eyes of many nations. Right? I'm not throwing weapons. I'll rain it down on them. I'll shake the mountains and spew the lava or whatever this means. Okay. And so the next so-called chapter opens. And you, O son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, remember, this is all one thought. Don't worry about the chapter number. All one thought coming out of Ezekiel about this Gog. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the ruler and the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Say, I'm against you, the ruler. Not the human being, I don't think, when he's referring to this chief prince, this first prince. This is the one who's, this is the, 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 the dark hand, right? The hidden hand is what I think is being referred to here. It comes through this lineage, this family, through this prince, this Gog who ruled that land at that time. This is what's been handed down, probably went from there to Babylon, to the Sumerian times or came from Nimrod and Babylon to this area. Anyway, that's what sound, you know, makes more sense to me in the overall reconciliation of scripture. Uh, the chief prince of, you know, I'm, I'm against you, O Gog, the ruler and the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I'll subdue you and gather you together and I'll cause you to come up from the north parts and bring you upon the mountains of Israel. See, God will do it. Keep listening, but keep in mind what's, what it's saying here. I will subdue you, right? I'll subdue you. How do you subdue someone? You, you know, put them in an arm lock. <laughs> I'll subdue you. Now, once you're subdued, what will I do? Throw you in the pit, lock you away? No, I'll subdue you and gather you together. And I'll cause you to come up from the north parts and bring you upon the mountains of Israel, and I will swerve your bow out of your left hand and cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your army and the many peoples that are with you. I've given you to the ravenous birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God, and I will send a fire on Magog, which is the place now. It sounds like Turkey, but it can mean more than that. And on the people who dwell peacefully in the islands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. I'm not sure what the, where those islands are. This Bible translates or has a suggestion of Japan, and I'm not sure. 
Uh, I don't know the history well enough to know how that, how the islands might be referred to here that play into it, or is it Cyprus and those islands of the Mediterranean, Sicily, that have all been part of the ancient history for so long, the cults and the, you know, I mean, Sicily, where all this murderous, violent mafia is, you know, comes out of Mazzini, Pike's partner at that time in the in the Masonic, you know, founding of this secret society that would carry on into the modern world, the warring against Christ, basically anything that might be good in the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I'll send a fire on Magog and on the people who dwell peacefully in the islands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Well, it sounds like they're profaning his name now, <laughs> and always have, right? Since Jesus said the same thing to him, you profane the name of God among the Gentiles. So here it is in Ezekiel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. So it was going on since Ezekiel. It was going on during the time of Jesus. And this is part of the declaration that at this very end, when, when God comes against Gog and destroys him, so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people, which means it isn't known now. And I will not let them profane my holy name anymore, which means they're still profaning his holy name now. And the Gentiles shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. See, because they can't know because my people are profaning my holy name. But after all this goes down, then I'll make my holy name known, right? When you see the fire and the brimstone raining down and it destroys all these people, it lands on them like it was, like it was precision laser-guided uh, rocket fire. If that's, if I'm reading this right, you know, then everyone will be convinced that I'm God and everyone will know my people will no longer be able to profane my name and the Gentiles will see that I'm really the Holy One of Israel. Behold, the day of which I have spoken is at hand, says the Lord God. Then the inhabitants of the villages of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the spears, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the lances, and they shall burn them as fuel for seven years, so that they shall not need wood for fuel out of the field or the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire and they shall take captive those who had taken them captive and plunder those who had plundered them, says the Lord God. And that, you know, oh, the Zionists are going to plunder the, the, Isra the, uh, the Arabs and the Muslims. Well, no, that not that what's been going on? Didn't the Zionists come a hundred years ago? And, and even though the Jewish people and the Christian people and the Muslim people were living side by side in relative peace and harmony, didn't the Zionists come and disrupt all that to carve out their state and, and create this third world war? Is the way I see it, create the circumstances by which the final conflict could come about and blame, blamed on God and, you know, blamed on these scriptures. And so to me, it's the other way around. The ones, they shall take captive those who had taken them captive, meaning the Palestinians shall finally, those innocent Palestinian Jews and Christians and Muslims who are just waiting for justice and mercy shall finally take captive these Zionists and plunder them. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. And it shall come to pass on that day that I'll give to Gog a place there for burial in the land of Israel, the great valley which is east of the sea, and they shall close off the valley, and there they shall bury Gog and all his army. And it shall be called the Valley of the Annihilation of Gog. And of course, that's over there where we call Plain of Megiddo and that valley that's south of Damascus between the sea and Jerusalem. I mean, if, if this is all going to happen that way, you wouldn't, you wouldn't catch me hanging out over there once that seven-year covenant gets ticking. Uh, and for seven months, 
The house of Israel shall be busy burying them, and then the land shall be cleansed. Yeah, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renowned day when I am glorified, says the Lord. So they'll remember that day when all these people were destroyed in that valley, this army of Gog. Even seven months after, there should be men who will travel continually through the land, burying those who are left lying on the face of the land to cleanse it. Now, this is what I say to Sheikh Imran Hossein. How is it possible that this is all nuclear war, that the smoke spoken of in the Quran, because one of the great signs, the, the ten signs of the end, is smoke. Just smoke. That's it. They ask, what's one of the, one of the signs is smoke. Huh. So Sheikh Imran Hussein says it's because nuclear weapons are going to leave all this mushroom cloud. That doesn't make much sense to me. But it does if volcanoes go off like Jesus said all over the world. Ah, you got that. Isn't that an easier sign to see you guys stop being in fear over all this crap that's on the internet on everybody's channel like Richie from Boston and everybody else because you know the real signs are clearly easy to wait for and there should be no fear that's that those are the you know that's so simple to see in what the scripture actually says so anyway uh seven months the house of Israel shall be busy burying them this is the following seven months after all these people are killed and see, Sheikh Hossein points out that it says 99 out of every 100 that fight in the battle for that gold will be killed. And so I find, again, these interesting parallels between our scripture that are hard to account for if Catholics just came in and wrote it. How'd they know that? Sounds like they co-opted something that God came along and dropped on another prophet. We know he wasn't the last prophet, in my opinion, because Nostradamus was clearly a prophet. And Rostodramus was 1500 AD. So he's just another prophet that the Catholics turned into this story that could, be, you know, become something worth, you know, that they could build armies around and use those armies. And that's pretty clear, even on a cursory examination, to see that that was done. Um, so anyway, I'm pointing out that it sounds more like what Ezekiel saying, and that what if volcanoes were shooting, and it just uh, so happened that whatever a volcano went off, you know, it all just happened to shoot a gigantic amount of falling debris into that valley, just for whatever reason, it all just fell in there like the twin towers falling into their own footprint. Just happened to shoot right into there and devour all those armies that way. Wouldn't that be something? And you wouldn't have nuclear fallout, would you? <laughs> so if this was caused by nuclear weapons, who's burying all the dead for seven months after this nuclear weapon? And then seven months later, there shall be men who will travel continually through the land, burying those who are left lying on the face of the land to cleanse it. Why? Because they're full of nuclear radiation? Well, how will anybody take the spoils of that land? So there's only two explanations. Either it's an argument you know, scripturally against nuclear weapons at all being anything but incendiary devices, and the, the uh, damage being done either with that kind of man-made incendiary device or some sort of natural, you know, sort of fire and brimstone you know, rained down by God, as it were, in whatever way that might happen, whether volcano or you know, meteor shower or something. I don't know if there's such a thing. Um, but clearly, uh, it's an argument against, in my view, this idea of nuclear radiation. Fukushima is an argument against it. The lack of footage, I understand there's been thousands and thousands and thousands of nuclear tests done over the years. I mean, you can go look, that's their official statement. All over the world, you can see, you can look up where's nuclear testing, and they show you in the last 50 years or whatever since they've been doing this, 60 years, 
all the nuclear testing where it's thousands of nuclear tests. And they've still only got those couple of pictures they show you, which many people seem to understand photographs, the ones that can pick apart the moon landing photos, can show you it's the same sort of stuff. You know, you you're not really getting what looks to be a genuine and undeniable picture of some unique event uh, called a nuclear explosion. So there's probably bombs that we'll call nuclear bombs, but they're probably not what they've told us. They're probably incendiary devices with a lot of power. And more than that, it's the whole nuclear bomb thing is probably just a uh, complete hoax to scare people, to another, you know, like alien invasion. It's that stupid. Doesn't mean they don't have Tesla technology where they can shoot beams down from what look like spaceships. That's the difference. One is the, the, the deception that is our reality. The other is the lie that keeps us from understanding the nature of the deception. We keep following spaceship technology that ufos have given us or nuclear weapons that are going to annihilate the world and leave radiation and poison us all and meanwhile they're working on stuff that has the effect they tell us a nuclear weapon has but it doesn't it isn't what they tell us it is so I, that's my you know I, the more and more i look at the nuclear threat the more i say that's just another scare and Someone is seemingly genuine and scholarly and valuable as Sheikh Imran Hossein is still talking about nuclear weapons and nuclear fallout and all this kind of stuff. And I say that's all BS. And anyway, here's a place in Ezekiel where at least the prophet's seeing that for seven months they'll be burying the dead. And then for seven months after that, There'll be people who constantly are traveling through there just to bury the dead to cleanse the land. And again, if we're going to say cleanse it from nuclear radiation, I don't see why burying the dead, you know. Why is that? What about all the animals? What about all the, it sounds like cleansing it in the way of spiritually getting your family members, getting your, you know, the bodies of humans from being eaten by animals and the things people would want to do. So... I'm going to leave that at that, and we'll finish uh, Ezekiel. And every one who passes through the land, so people will be passing through this land, and sees a man's bones, then shall he set up a sign by it till barriers have come and taken it and buried it in the valley of Gog. Right? So they'll keep up. Oh, here's one. Here's another. You know, so that, like, I don't know, this giant memorial or whatever. And everyone who passes through the land and sees a man's bone, then he shall set up a sign by it to barriers have come and taken it. So a bone, not a skeleton, just a bone. All right, that's interesting. And the name of the graveyard shall be the mighty city. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And you, son of man, say to all the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field, Thus says the Lord God, assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves from every place to the great sacrifice I perform for you upon the mountains of Israel, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood. So, you know, get the poem here, guys, the great sacrifice of all these violent people that just wouldn't follow God from the very beginning. Love your neighbor. Just love. You know it in your heart. It's in your heart. Do what's in your heart. The prophets have come to lead you. To tell you to call you on it to tell you get back on the path to you know and no you're just going to follow this other spirit all the way to this vicious foul evil wars or conquest that's good, that that is ultimately this great sacrifice of god himself which to me fits back into a bigger metaphysical picture of the ultimate redemption of man and this being part of the ultimate redemption of man and all these physical lives not being as important as the spiritual one that's that we're all embarked on uh, without getting too occult uh, and in this bible study but still you know we got to break down our our silly 
brain dead, brainwashed ideas that God's after just these believers and every other soul to God is nothing more than something as fodder to burn in hell. That's a Talmudic idea. That's not really supportable by the rest of Christianity. And I, I'm always reflecting on the fact that, you know, the whole world, God did not, Christ didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. It's interesting how right there, as in so many places, when I go through the New Testament, perfect opportunity to point out that God didn't come to condemn the whole world, but just most of them, just 99% and to save that small ones that would follow him. You know, why not separate it that way? Because it makes so much more sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then leave that for a bunch of hypocrites like Pharisees or modern fundamentalist Christians or modern fundamentalist Muslims to decide what God wants, what God doesn't want, who God forgives and who God doesn't forgive and who's going where. Instead of simply following love, following what's obviously true and good in your heart, thinking you got to impose God's will on others. That's that's forbade by God and it's forbade by just the spirit of God that exists inside each person. And that's why turning that into the vision of God, of course, is the smart strategic way to turn people against the spirit of God. Make God look like, you know, profane the name of God amongst the world by making it look like first the Pharisees in Jesus' time or all the way back to the, you know, these worshipers of Baal. Turn people into worshipers of themselves. People willing to sacrifice children to show that they're beyond good and evil. I think. Anyhow, um, they'll eventually cleanse the land and say to the birds of the air, come and assemble yourself for the great sacrifice that I perform for you, you the birds, upon the mountains of Israel, and you shall eat the flesh and drink the blood. You'll eat the flesh of the mighty men, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of fatlings, of he-goats, and of bullocks, of all the young bullocks of Bashan. And you shall eat flesh till you're filled and drink blood till you're drunk at the great sacrificial feast which I am preparing for you. Thus you should be filled at my table and the flesh of horses and their riders and with them that of mighty men and with that of all the men of war, says the Lord God. Again, men of war tying into the Quranic vision that 99 out of every 100 that go to fight for that gold will be killed. Not 99 out of every 100 people on the earth the fight for that gold, and perhaps it's this battle that he's talking about because it's the gold that comes out of the river Euphrates. So it's sort of site-specific. But um, it, again, all these animals killed. It's nuclear. This is all, everything's all nuclear radiated, but God's invited him. Come and eat all this nuclear radiation now. We're, come, we're about to start over our millennial kingdom beautiful future on the earth full of nuclear radiation because there's no such thing you guys not in the way they tell it to us and I will set my glory among the nations and all the Gentiles shall see the judgment that I've executed and the heavy punishment with which I punish them so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward now, wait a minute. Who's God punishing? All those terrible, terrible Muslims, right? All those Persians, right? Now, wait a minute. Remember, this is after the war with Gog and those people. Who are those people? Remember, this is all God's family out of Noah, guys. His people. We're all his people. These are all his people after the flood. And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the Gentiles shall see the judgment I've executed, and the heavy punishment with which I've punished them, who? The Gentiles, right? They'll see what I did. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. And the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel was carried into captivity for their iniquity. 
because they transgressed against me. Therefore I turned away my face from them and delivered them into the hand of those who hate them. And they all fell by the sword. According to their abominations and according to their iniquity have I rewarded them. And I turned away my face from them. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Now I will bring back the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon all the house of Israel and will be zealous for my holy name's sake. Huh? Well, wait, what's... So wait a minute, now let's reread that again. Who's this heavy punishment on? Who's he showing the Gentiles? And I'll set my glory among all the nations and all the Gentiles, so she the judgment that I've executed and the heavy punishment with which I have punished them, so the house of Israel shall know that I'm the Lord their God from that day and forward. Huh, that's a little different when you put a comma there. The them is the house of Israel, you guys. It's us. It's the Zionists, to put it shortly. I believe that if you will insert the word Zionist here into these next couple of paragraphs, you will understand what's going on here with this judgment. Not just Gog, but Gog is part of this Zionism movement to get their way in this. Or they're seizing the opportunity. In other words, this punishment that's come upon Gog has also fulfilled this anger of God toward his people. And that's why we can start over here. That's why I want you to see this, this last part of chapter 39 now. And I'll set my glory among the nations and all the Gentiles shall see the judgment that I've executed. The Gentiles, right? Not my people will see it. You'll see how he's talking about his people, but all the Gentiles are going to see this judgment I've executed and the heavy punishment with which I punish them. Them could be, yes, the Gentiles. Let's agree there. But connected with the rest of the thought to realize he's talking about the, the house of Israel. So the house of Israel shall know that I'm the Lord their God from that day and forward. Because he saw the way I punished the Gentiles, right? However, now, and the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel was carried into captivity for their iniquity, right? So he's not, he's saying, everyone's seeing this punishment. The Gentiles are going to see the heavy hand I punished them, right? You, all you Gentile, you Chinese, you, you Buddhists, you Indians, is the way I see it. You, all the nations. I'll set my glory among all the nations. My glory, right? The Indians will see God's glory. What's God's glory? I killed you. I'm sending you all to hell. That doesn't sound like glory. I'll set my glory among all the nations. And all the Gentiles shall see the judgment that I've executed. Right? He's exposing the righteous judgment that he's supposed to be so praised for at the end of all these things you know, apocalyptic visions. And the heavy judgment, which I punish them, the Gentile nations. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord, their God, from that day and forward. From that day and forward, right? Because up until then, the house of Israel's the whore riding the beast, as we've discussed in my view. From that day forward, they'll know I'm the Lord, their God. And the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel was carried into captivity for their iniquity because they transgressed against me. Therefore, I turned my face away from them and delivered them into the hand of those who hate them. And they all fell by the sword. This is the Zionists. The Gentiles are going to see. Oh, God wasn't for, he didn't punish us to, because he was for these Gentile for these Zionists. He didn't punish us, these Gentile nations in this great battle where all these armies got slaughtered. He didn't do that to us to, to, to uphold this Zionism. No, the Gentiles will likewise see, after they, uh, they see the glory of God, the heavy punishment that's come uh, upon their nation, they will see how the house of Israel was carried away into captivity for their iniquity. And that all this was done because God turned away from them. God hasn't been with them. They've been doing their own thing in the name of God. 
this house of Israel, sons of the living God, the so-called Roman Catholic Church and Protestant Christianity, all this garbage, even Orthodox Christianity, I'm finding out, just because that's where the church went. They were conquered also a long time ago and everything wiped out. So Orthodox Christianity is, of course, also on the payroll as far as an official entity. So anyway, the Gentiles know that the house of Israel is carried into captivity for their iniquity because they transgressed against me. Therefore, I turned away my face from them, delivered them into the hand of those who hate them. And they all fell by the sword. According to their abominations and according to their iniquity have I rewarded them, and I turned away my face from them. This is the house of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon all the house of Israel. See, because that's all us or whatever, these sons of the living God where they were scattered all over the world. That's the house of Israel. Anyone who follows, claims the name of Jesus is part of the house of Israel as well. Now I will bring back the captivity of Jacob that's what the captivity of Jacob is one reference to that lineage that the land was given to. And will have mercy on all the house of Israel and will be zealous for my holy name's sake. After they have borne all their shame and their iniquity, whereby they have transgressed against me, when they dwell securely in their own land with no one to hurt them. When I have gathered them from among the nations and brought them back from the cities of their enemies and am sanctified by them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God. Can we read that again, all you Christians that want to imagine this state of Israel today? I mean, what did he just say? After they have borne all their shame, house of Israel, Christianity, Laodicean church, Zionist, pathetic, abominable iniquities that he just said, according to their abominations and according to their iniquity, have I rewarded them? All this sword is coming because of this abominable way these Christian so-called nations have supported this so-called Zionism to go use war and death and destruction, violence hypocrisy to go steal so to pretend that that's got anything to do with god because a few people say jesus jesus and wave the american flag oh my goodness abominable so he turned his face away from them and i turned away my face from them therefore thus says the lord now i will bring back the captivity of jacob now when guys are anybody following this? Is this not after this annihilation of Gog and all the hordes that are with Gog, all these people that have been annihilated in this valley? When is this? Does, is this not what we might call the beginning of this so-called millennial kingdom? That's when he'll bring back the captivity of Jacob and have mercy on this great whore. Christianity, Catholicism, House of Israel, riding the beast. After they born all their shame and their iniquity, whereby they have transgressed against me, when they dwell securely in their own land with no one to hurt them, after this war, during this millennial kingdom, when I have gathered them from among the nations and brought them back from the cities of their enemies after this war during the millennial kingdom, and am sanctified by them in the sight of many nations after this war in the millennial kingdom, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God who caused them to be carried captive, the, who caused them to be carried captive among the nations, and that it is I who gathered them into their own land and have left none of them there any more. Neither will I turn away my face from them, but I will pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, says the Lord. 
See? Then in this millennial kingdom shall they know that I am the Lord their God who caused them to be carried captive among the nations and that it is I who gathered them into their own land. Not the Rothschilds banking system, not the United Nations, not the Zionist movement, not America with all her guns and killing. How that could ever be claimed as anything from God is just a disgusting, well, abominable, abominations. According to their abominations and according to their iniquity, have I rewarded them, and I turned away my face from them. And that's the Laodicean church as well, and that is all of us. And so next week, if you want to be here, let's talk about, you know, what does it really mean? to be on the right side of the equation as far as you know, claiming to be a Christian, following Jesus, waiting for all this in the right frame of reference, rather than thinking we're so special and we're the chosen one. God's coming to kill everybody so he can set us up in a kingdom, take us to heaven and put everybody in hell. Sounds like he's saying most people are profaning his name until this end comes. Sounds like Paul said an apostasy had to come before this man of sin could be revealed. So the, the house of Israel is clearly the whore, the great whore, always has been. And it's not until after this battle that God will then bring back the people to that land. And after their shame, not just bring them back, look it, because you're so good. No, now I'm bringing you back. Don't you realize why I caused you to go away for your abominations and your iniquity? And we go, yes, we're absolutely ashamed. And after our shame, when we live our shame down, all the nations will see who God is and that it's finally God who's brought back these people who are now ashamed of their abominations and iniquity. So that's, that's really how I, you know, Ezekiel 38 and 39 goes down as far as I can tell the Gog and Magog story. So thanks for being here. Talk to you next week. Keep loving your neighbor.